أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم and welcome to the fourth and final installment of our Tales from the Cave series uh, we focused on Surah Al-Kahf chapter 18 of the Quran um, this Ramadan where it's there are four wonderful stories that we can take lots of lessons um, and inspiration from so this week inshallah and uh, we have got Fahim Bukhari who is um, who has studied Islamic studies for a number of years and has been part of the Islamic Society of Britain and Young Muslims UK and helping out at things like the YM residentials um, and various other activities that we've supported. So today, um, Fahim will be talking to us about um, the story of Thul Qarnayn. So I will hand over and uh, pass to Fahim. Cool, perfect. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I hopefully share my screen. And we can make a start. So, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I seek refuge from the Akar Shaitan and in, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. So, just double checking, you guys can see my screen, okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. So start off with a little bit of an introduction. So this is the fourth story in Surah Al-Kahf um, and it focuses on Dhul Qarnayn as well as his journey and the tribes of Ya'juj Ma'juj. Over the course of this topic, we'll analyse the story, talk about people and look at the moral lessons it teaches. A little picture of what you could expect him to look like because it's... Um, yeah, we'll move on to it, but there's someone that has sort of two horns on his um, helmet, but you'll learn a bit more as we go on why that's there. So, a bit about Zulqarnain. Zulqarnain is a strong, righteous Muslim king. He was the one who had saved a village from Ya'ajuj Ma'ajuj. He was known as the man with two horns because he had worn a helmet that was composed of two horns. Now, a little bit about that. Um, there's a difference of opinion uh, among the scholars of this seer as to what exactly does this title of the one with two horns mean. Some scholars say it means the horns of the east and the west due to the, his rule, due to his ruling spanning the two ends of the earth. Others say that perhaps it is due to the locks or braids in his hair. Yeah, um, other opinions exist and that Allah, Allah knows best what the exact meaning is. The, the majority of scholars are of the opinion that he was not a prophet, but rather a righteous ruler or a king. The exact identity of this um, great king is not mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, and therefore we can't pinpoint exactly who he could have been. The important thing is the lessons we can derive from his story. So a few aspects to imagine. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him strength in two forms, both physical. He was able to lift heavy materials way past human imagination. And he was also given power through his reign and army. Note that many, many people feared him when the word was given that he was coming to attack a village or place. They often destroyed themselves with fear of his arrival. He had conquered almost all the civ civ um, civilizations at that time and had preached Islam to all of them. So moving on to Ya'ajuj Majuj. Ya'ajuj Majuj are two separate tribes. They are extremely evil, corrupt, and primitive. The two names come from the word uh, Ujaj, which is dry and harsh in nature, as well as Al-Aj, an enemy that comes fast and quick. Um, primitive for, means basically a person who belongs to an early stage of civilization. So basically pe people who live in sort of a very... Simple, simple way. Um, so a few aspects to imagine is many scholars have stated that they are small in height. Um, they cause destruction wherever they go, murder, chaos, fear, and and, and more. Um, and they're vast in number. Um, so to put it into perspective is that every one human is equal to 999 Yajuj Majuj. So you can imagine there's what 
billion people on, on the earth multiply by 999. So moving on. So the story of Zulkar 9 is quite interesting. As we said before, Zulkar 9 would travel looking for places to conquer. One day he decided to travel to where the sun sets. So he went to the west. There he saw a place that had murky waters. Um, it was revealed to him whether he wanted to punish the people there who were evil or reward them. He chose to do nothing and travelled to where the sun rises. Here again he met with people who are primitive and had no cover from the sun. He decided to take a different path. His last journey took him to a place between two mountains. Many scholars believe that this is somewhere near Turkey or Turkestan. Just beyond those mountains was a village. In that place, there were people who needed Dolkonen's help. These people were cut off from civilization and were um, crude. They were unable to communicate with Dolkonen, but eventually did. They, they said, all oh, the possessor of two horns, verily, these two tribes have created a lot of mischief on the earth. So if we give you some money, will you put a barrier between us and them? He said, look, what God has already given me is enough. I don't need your wealth, but I will help you. The people had helped Zulkarnain by helping him make the mixture that he needed, and they had built the barrier. This kind of just puts into perspective how, how if there's between two mountains, how much work would have gone in to build a barrier. We don't, nowadays we have, uh, again, this is just a parent's perspective, it's not the actual picture uh, of the barrier, but um, as we don't know where that is, however, to build a barrier between two mountains takes a lot of work and um, being in the sort of world of construction or engineering, you understand that with all the materials and the, the um, plants that we've got at the moment to do this work, it still takes a long time and it's very difficult. So getting the, something like this done without all these machinery and um, equipment must a lot a lot you must you must be uh, you must have sort of power that is unimaginable to do something like that. So a few uh, we can take some moral lessons from this. Um, as we all know, every story in Surah Al Kahf teaches a lesson. For this one, we can learn many. For example, the responsibility of power. Another one was the trials of authority. And the last and most important was to only have expectations um, of the hereafter. Um, for the lessons, he, he plays an important role in benefiting humanity in a way many people don't realise. For helping and bringing benefit to others is, a, is from the greatest of good deeds. The Prophet ﷺ said, all the creation are dependent of Allah and the most beloved of them to Allah are the ones who are beneficial unto others. So power comes from Allah and he grants it to whom he wills. The purpose of that power should be to benefit others and not for corruption or selfish motives. Our gifts and talents are granted to us by Allah and should be used for good and beneficial reasons. It should be a means of gaining nearness to Allah and his great rewards for our hereafter. Zulkarnain helped the weak and oppressed by protecting them, but he also helped others build shelter and gain skills for carpentry and agriculture. There are many skills and crafts we may know that can help and improve the lives of others. And by doing it with sincerity and for the sake of Allah, one has the opportunity to gain reward from Allah. A few adaptations of the story is that many say that Alexander the Great as spoken in the Bible was Zulkarnain, but that's, this cannot be true as Alexander, and Alexander the Great had the atrocities in his kingdom and worshipped idols. The closest reference to Zulkarnain is in the Hebrew Bible, that of King Cyprus. He had travelled to the east and the west and only worshipped one god and had spread peace. And that's, that's all. Thanks very much for listening. Amazing, Jazakallah Khair. Um, as we share some reflections um, and some lessons on, from this story, I'd like to invite Izzet, who um, who joins us 
is it is um is currently a full-time student but has been supporting some of the work that we do in young muslims for our classes for 11 to 13 and 14 to 16. Um, so Jazakallah Khair for being here, um, is it? Um, you know, Fahim, one of the things that strikes me about this story, about it being um, about a just ruler, um, you know, with everything that's going on at the moment in, in Gaza and Palestine and all of the campaigning and the, um, the, the activism and the work that a lot of the community Muslim and non-Muslim community is doing to campaign to get leaders to do something and just the frustration at the inactivity. But it's almost like complete contrast to what the, the lessons of the of this just ruler that we that we listen to, that we just heard and learned about from about the from the Lord I, I really agree with you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just listening to a khutbah from Masjid al-Aqsa, where the khatib or the imam, he was addressing all of the Muslim ummah altogether. He was talking about the days when we had leaders like Salah Abdin and other leaders who would go out and defend the Muslims in their lands and in their homes and not allow them to be oppressed in the most, in most gruesome and awful ways that they're being oppressed today. Uh, as he was addressing uh, the Muslim Ummah, he said, out of the Muslims, there, need, there needs to be a leader. There needs to be a leader who uh, who forbids the evil and who encourages the good in order that Al-Aqsa can finally be freed from its chains again. And Al-Aqsa can finally breathe again and no, no longer suffer from the pain of occupation. I, I also had a few other reflections from uh, the story of Dhulkarnayn, just to show how much of a just and pious ruler he was. For example, when he went up to the people who were suffering from oppression, suffering from the oppression of Yaqjud and Mashud, instead of those people becoming scared of Dhulkarnayn's great and powerful army, and they immediately just began to ask him for help. They immediately put their trust in uh, a great ruler like Dhulkarnayn and began to tell them, uh, uh, tell the, him and his army about their problems. And they expected that Dhulkarnayn would treat them fairly and treat them justly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many of us do you think could do that now to just have a request to a leader and expect a, a, a just, mm. prompt response as well? And actually, yeah, we, we couldn't even approach our own leaders and do that. But, but the fact that Dhulkarnayn was a foreign ruler. They didn't even understand each other's language. Somehow they managed to convey all this message by, by sign language or by interpreting it through other people. Um, Dhulkarnayn was so distant from these people, yet he did so much for them. He completely he, he saved them. And he didn't accept payment either, so they offered payment, but he said yeah. that, you know, Allah has given me with everything I need. And and it's, it just feels like it's just... It's so far removed from what some of our own experiences have been of, of leaders, not always at kind of on the global level, but even sometimes at a community level. Um, and so there's so much that so much wisdom in this story being preserved and the lessons that we that we can take from this, particularly around that the responsibility of being a leader and the and the being being just. Yeah, hundred percent. And and even to, to add on that, like obviously Zulkanain was given powers that we can't imagine, but everybody themselves, if you look at the story, what we can learn is we all have something that we can give um and help others. Um, no matter where you're from or which part of the country or if you're part of the oppressed or not, um you you are still in a position to do good and for 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 the benefit of the hereafter and just for Allah's sake. Without, without wanting anything in return in this life. And that's something that we we see so importantly from the Qurnayn's life, that he didn't want anything from the people. Our experiences of leadership nowadays, they want, they want more power, they want influence just for the sake of it, not for the sake of doing something better out of it, just so they can gather mm -hmm. more of this world. But that's not... But that's actually what Dhulkarnayn was working against. He had his complete trust and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he had to bestow upon him. Afterwards, he, uh, af after this great mission is completed, he says the words, He doesn't attribute anything to himself. 
and any of his power to himself. Instead, he says, this is but the mercy of my Lord. And, the, and of course, we know Allah is the most merciful, the most gracious. Oh. Were there any part of the story, maybe um, Fahim will ask you first, what, what, was, what would be your favourite part of the story or something that really, um, really resonated with you? Um, to be honest, it was the part where he would go out of his way to travel to all these places just, uh, you know, to help the communities. Um, he's, you know, he could have just been with that type of power. Um, you could imagine what he would receive in terms of even back then. Um, he he would get if you want the fame, the popularity, and just worldly benefits he could have got all of that but his intention was nothing to do with that and it was quite clear what he, what um what his intent was and it was just to help others for Allah's sake um and so like again we don't know exactly what his stasis is or because it's, there's not mentioned in the hadith of quran but we, the, the fact that he's mentioned in the quran uh, you know it's, it speaks of volumes. Yeah, yeah. He really is an example for all leaders, um, wherever they may be, um, that come after him. It, it, it reminds me also of one of the great Khalifas of the past. His name was uh, Omar bin Abdul Aziz. He mm -hmm. was the great grandson of Omar bin Khattab. On his deathbed, he recited the verse. تلك الدار الآخرة نجعلها للذين لا يريدون علوما في الأرض ولا فسادا والعاقبة للمتقين. The home of the hereafter, it says in the Quran, we reserve only for those who seek neither tyranny nor corruption on the earth. Mm -hmm. The ultimate outcome belongs only to the righteous. Subhanallah. And here we see examples of those people that that not only read and learnt this knowledge but completely lived it. Bishal, Subhanallah. Thank you for sharing that. I think for me, you know, one of the things that um, is quite a small detail, but just thinking about the scale of that structure that was built between the two mountains, like with no crane and with no, mm. no, no engine, no, no, nothing is motorized. Like obviously, the crane was given additional, was given that strength, but just the um, the engineering behind making that, like making bridges yeah. now is not a small deal. Um, so like doing that at that time, just subhanAllah, like just uh, yeah. really, really amazes me. And uh, could, could, could we mention a, a bit about what, um, what will happen in the end with Yajur and Matjur? So, uh, so it's, it, each, each and every day, uh, yeah, Jun and Matjur just take down this barrier, they claw at it, so they bite away at it until it's completely down uh, to the bottom. But then the next day, um, as the sun rises, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restores the wall until, um, as Dulkan mentions, on the last day, the wall will no longer be restored. And that, that will be the day when uh, yeah, Jun and Matjur will be able to ro roam free and spread their corruption on us. Yeah, may Allah protect us from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and is it last question, similar, same question to that I asked for him, um, I'll ask to you, was there any part of that story that really resonated or um, your favourite section, uh, a favourite part from that? Uh, what I really loved was just the imagery, the way he travelled from this place that the sun rises mm -hmm. to the place that the sun sets, and then he travels uh, between the mountains. It just shows the great expanse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's world. Um, the, there's another ayah in the Quran, and it says, "Inna ardi wasi'atun fa iya which which means that the earth of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is vast. So worship me only. It shows that, um, in in a way that we can we can feel stuck, or mm -hmm. we we can close ourselves off from the worship of, of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But indeed, it's very vast, and and it's for us to explore the various signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to to experience his creation and experience is worship yeah for sure i feel like the more time that you spend in allah's creation the more that your heart just glorifies god and the more that you just sit in the 
it, it, the the awesomeness of what and of what of Allah and, and of what has been created and what we've been blessed with to to be around. Um, sometimes I see it on like social media, these Instagram travelers, and they're in these really beautiful exotic places, and I don't look at that and think. Uh, you know, it, it's whatever the, they might be going around for for likes and for for to promote it. But I'm always just so so in awe of the beauty of this of just the earth and subhanallah. Um, you know, to you you're exactly right. Um, in in that uh, in that reflection, there is it. So um, just like a Um, well, any anything else either of you would like to add before we close? Yeah, I think um, it would be good to add some of the verses of the Quran um, on this topic to close off or to end with. Yes, that sounds like yeah. the best way to end. Okay, um, just to make it easier, I'll put it on the screen too. So yeah, just let me know when that's sharing. Yeah, that's it. So what I'll do is I'll read the Arabic and then we'll go through the translation, inshallah. Yeah. Um, inna حتى إذا بلغ مغرب الشمس وجدها تغرب في عين حمئة ووجد عندها قوما قلنا يا ذا القرنين إما أن تعذب وإما أن تتخذ فيهم حسنا قال أما من ظلم فسوف نعذبه ثم يرد إلى رب ثم يرد إلى ربه فيعذبه عذابا نكرا وأما من آمن وعمل صالحا فله جزاء فله جزاء الحسن وسنقول له من أمرنا يسرا ثم أتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ مطلع الشمس وجدها تطلع على قوم لم نجعل لهم من دونها سترا كذلك وقد أحطنا بما لديه خبرا ثم أتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ بين السدين وجد من دونها قوما لا يكادون يفقهون قولا <تصفيق> قالوا يا ذا القنين إن يأجوج ومأجوج مفسدون في الأرض فهل نجعل لك خرجا على أن تجعل بيننا وبينهم سدا قال ما مكنني في فيه ربي خير فعينوني بقوة قال مك قال ما مكنني فيه ربي خير فاعينوني بقوة أجعل بينكم وبينهم ردما آتوني زبر الحديد حتى إذا سام بين الصدفين قال انفقوا حتى إذا جعله نارا قال آتوني أفرغ عليه قطرا فما استطاعوا فما استطاعوا أن يظهروه وما استطاعوا له نقبا قال هذا رحمة من ربي فإذا جاء وعد ربي جعله دكاء وكان وعد ربي حقا. So, so just going to the translation. They ask you, O oh Prophet, about Zulqarnain, say, I will relate to you something of this narrative. Surely we established him in the land and gave him the means to all things. So he traveled a course until he reached the setting point of the sun which appeared to him to be setting in a spring of murky water where he found some people he said Ozul Qurnayn either punish them or treat them kindly he responded whoever does wrong will be punished by us then will be returned to the Lord who will punish who will punish them with a horrible torment as for those who believe and do good they will have the finest reward and we will assign them easy commands then he traveled a different course until he reached the rising point of the sun he found it rising on people for whom we had provided no shelter from it. So it was, and we truly had full knowledge of him. Then he travelled a third course until he reached a pass between two mountains. He found in front of them a people who could hardly understand his language. They pleaded, Ozul Qarnayn, surely Gog Magog are spreading corruption throughout the land. Should we pay you tribute provided 
that you build a wall between us and them. He responded, what my Lord has provided for me is far better, but assist me with resources and I will build a barrier between you and them. Bring me blocks of iron. Then we had filled up the gap between the two mountains. He ordered below. When the iron became red hot, he said, bring me molten copper to pour over it. And so the enemies could neither scale nor tunnel through it. He declared, this is a mercy from my Lord. But when the promise of my Lord comes to pass, he will level it to the ground. And my Lord's promise is always true. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, this then now concludes our four part series where we've been reflecting on the stories from Surah al Kahath. I would like to end with the hadith that was narrated by um, Umar ibn al Khattab about the benefits of reciting um, Surah al Kahf. That is said that if you, um, whoever reads Surah al Kahf on the night of Juma, will have a light that stretched between him and the Kaaba. Um, and so if you imagine doing that every week, the um uh, you get into that habit and the practice of reciting surah al kahf every week the the benefits that are in there from you but i think that what i've learned from from learning all these four stories in depth is that it's not just about the recitation but actually understanding the lessons that every story in surah al kahf teaches us and if we were to take them on and we practice them and embody them they will they will keep us guided and they will keep us um keep us on on the on the right path and we'll be we'll do right by ourselves we will do right by the people and the community that are around us and of course we will um uh, and we hope that Allah will reward us for that if we keep our, keeping our intentions sincere so um as we uh, as we end and as we come to the end of Ramadan perhaps this is a habit that we can continue with the recitation and the reflection and the understanding of surah al-kahf and may may Allah make it easy that we can apply all of the lessons that we've learned that Allah chose to preserve in the Quran for us to be able to learn from them, may we continue to do so, um, and may that um, uh, and may Allah reward us, um, uh, reward our efforts for that. Amen. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam.